Well, uh, thank you, Meredith and the ZTIA team for providing this platform to talk about 5G. I'm going to talk about one of many applications with what we're going to do, uh, about what Brett talked about. Um, this is a big deal for us at Ericsson, climate change, but it's also personal to me. Uh, my father is a man of science. He dedicated his life to saving rainforests. I think that's why my team came up with the rainforest in the background. Uh, I've spent my career at Ericsson trying to understand how we can use our technology for good. And like many of you, you probably have a couple of kids around the breakfast table that make sure you don't forget. Climate is a big deal to them. And what I will try to do today, uh, I have a bunch of slides for you, is to try to unpack and get a little bit practical about what and how we should go after this. So I'll start by trying to create some kind of a burning platform. I hope you will be with me for that. Then I'm going to start talking a little bit about what are we doing at Ericsson uh, with our own operations to sort of try to lead by example what we're doing together with our customers to make sure that we can help drive climate change. And then probably most importantly, what we can all do together to accelerate the digital transformation across industries and the public sector, because that's really what's going to make the most important difference. So the burning platform, uh, I don't think we have to debate that. It's pretty clear. I mean, the last eight years are the hottest on record since 1880. Last year alone in the US, we saw over 20 natural disasters causing damages of 148 billion US dollars, 724 lives lost. So I think it goes without saying that we have a problem. Global leaders met in Paris in 2015 to try to agree on measures to combat climate change and to try to limit the global warming to 1.5 degrees above the pre-industrial age. We met again in Glasgow, COP26, uh, last year, and uh, 64 countries representing almost 90%, 89 to be precise, of the global CO2 emissions recommitted to the climate change axis, the exponential roadmap for climate change, which basically is a halving of the CO2 emissions in the, every decade for net zero by 2050. Even with all those commitments, there has been plenty of research recently we're heading for 1.7, maybe two degrees warming as we stand here today. We're currently at 1.1, and uh, I read an article coming in this morning that it's not unlikely, 50-50 chance, that in within the next five years, we're actually gonna be at 1.5 for a single year. So that doesn't mean that we're consistently at 1.5, but that should give us another warning sign that we're not on a good path here. Now, it's not all bad news, and that's why we're here today. If we think about the global emissions, and if we think about the industry that most of us here today represent, the ICT sector, we may only be a small part, 1.4% of the global CO2 emissions, but we impact up to 15% or more of industries accounting for 15% of the global CO2 emissions. That is what the digital transformation of industries and the public sector is all about, is how we can use digital technologies, digital wireless technologies to transform industries. The latest numbers by CTIA talk about a 20% contribution to the US climate reduction program. So a significant impact that our industries can have on climate change. We have been public about our net zero journey for the past 25 years. There's been climate reports issued by Ericsson for the last 25 years. It's a busy slide. The, the green area is our own supply chain, inbound, outbound. You can hardly see our own CO2 emissions at this point. It's 0.4% of the total equation. 8% is the green part today. And then 90% is our products in service with our customers. So we're not stopping at measuring our own CO2 emissions. 
we have added a and are taking ownership for actually changing the trajectory for our customers. And as an industry, uh, we should be proud. Uh, certainly in North America, our uh, customers are way ahead of the global averages. Uh, we have a clear path to renewables, and we have a clear path and commitments by all leading service providers to net zero. On a global basis, it's about one-third of the big operators that have science-based targets like we do. And that is, of course, the biggest part of the equation that we're going after. We're committed to net zero in our own operations by 2030. That's around the corner. Happy to report that we are over 60% there. So our own operations, we're doing a good job with. Examples like we just a couple of months ago, as we were coming back from COVID, opening up our offices, lifting the travel ban, decided to limit all travel to 50% maximum compared to pre-COVID. So we're trying to get real serious about not traveling a bunch. And then, of course, I come back and talk about uh, our latest example, which is our new smart factory in Louisville, Texas. Our supply chains, so this is inbound and outbound. 90% of our suppliers, we have line of sight to signing them up to science-based targets and net zero commitments. That's the inbound supply, the outbound we control. And then uh, we are on a path to also half the emissions by our customers. This is, of course, a lot of work on the technology side. Today, our 5G products produce a nine, perform 9x, that's a bit, little bit over 9x, more efficiently than 4G. And before the year is over, we'll be able to give an order of magnitude better power efficiencies to our customers. So 10x improvement in terms of power efficiencies. With that, we're actually on track to get to net zero by 2040, 10 years ahead of the, the global ambitions. And by that time frame, we're also looking at removing re residual carbon dioxide uh, from the atmosphere altogether. So that is something that starts in the later years when you start approaching net zero out, you can then also start uh, putting uh, CO2 back into the bedrock actually. So if I now start looking at the big part, the yellow part, this is how we then can use technology to help our customers reduce CO2 emissions. The blue curve, the exponential growth, shows that over the last 10 years, our customers have seen a 300x growth in traffic in their networks, new subscribers and data growth. And with the latest uh, um, evolutions on the technology side, the increase in power consumption is limited to 64%. But that's still an increase. That's a problem, the way we think about it. And you see that with every previous generation. We are able to produce more data, connect more subscribers, more devices, but at the end of the day, it takes more power to produce that. So we are spending a lot of effort now on figuring out how we break the energy curve, leveraging 5G, AI, machine learning, and other technologies to do that. And this is going to be a combination of, of course, improved hardware performance. We see 15 to 30 percent improved performance in our latest generation of radio products, 7 to 15 percent on the software, advanced sleep modes, no sight uh, emits uh, unless it's absolutely necessary. So advanced sleep mode. This is still not, if you did the math, this is still not going to get us to break the energy curve. So of course, we also need to work a lot together with our customers to optimize the way they build the networks, sites where we need them, how they run the networks. So we are really optimizing all of the operations for our customers. And then the combination of that should allow us to break the energy curve. And this is, of course, something we're very committed to solving together with our customers. As you saw, that's the big part of our own emissions. At this point, still only talking about the 1.4% of global CO2 emissions to put it into perspective. So now let's talk about what we can do leveraging our technologies together with our customers transforming industries. This is a picture of our smart factory in Louisville, Texas. This is where we produce 5G gear uh, for our customers in the US, open during the pandemic, which would not have been possible without the technology. We could actually not fly our operators, machine operators, 
to Estonia where we have our reference factory and we could not fly the technicians from Estonia to our factory in Louisville because of the pandemic. <laughs> so we were actually training our factory operators with virtual reality goggles standing on the factory floor in Louisville even before the machinery arrived being trained by technicians sitting in Estonia. The kind of things you can do with technology. We still use that same technology for remote support. Now uh, our machine operators can get remote support. They can troubleshoot with overlaid uh, AI on goggles on iPads using the same technology. Uh, we have connected AGVs that uh, improve the material handling across the factory, wireless of course. Uh, digital twinning technology, which allows us to replicate the entire operation, identify weaknesses, and uh, anticipate uh, supply chain issues, anticipate um, production issues. We have uh, preventive maintenance sensors in screwdrivers. Sounds silly, but prevents the screwdriver from catastrophic failure. How catastrophic can it be when a screwdriver fails, you can argue. But it could actually break the circuit board when you are adjusting it, and that could be catastrophic because that means one radio less in a supply chain constraint situation going to our customers. After one year of operation, we have seen impressive triple bottom line impact. 65% reduced material handling, 50% less unplanned downtime, 40% less travel, which I talked about, and 25% more productivity in the site. This is 18 months, to be precise, into the operation of our factory. So very encouraging results. And what we see, uh, compared to a similar factory, we're operating at 24% less energy consumption. And of course, it's all renewables from day one. 75% uh, less water consumption for this site. Uh, that has actually earned us a couple of distinctions from World Economic Forum. I think we're now one of three global lighthouse factories that has uh, achieved these levels of sustainability improvements. We have an LED gold certification at this point, and the team is bullish that we will get LED zero certification for this site as well. The quality of life for our employees improves. You can now work with less skilled labor, leveraging AR to perform more skill, more complex tasks. So that increases the work quality for our employees. Safety, of course, I talked about the AGVs, is a big deal. 2.2 productivity gain per employee. This makes the business case for relocating high-tech manufacturing to the US. It's a $100 million investment for us, 400 jobs. This is something that we could perfectly well port to other industries. Manufacturing is one place to start. But you will see when I talk about some other uh, examples, it's typically the same technology, the same capabilities that you reuse across industries. So let's look at transportation. The single largest contributor to CO2 emissions as an industry in the US. Here we're working, uh, this is a GE site. We're working together with a Swedish manufacturer of electrical autonomous pods, driverless. Uh, and they have done some really interesting work with one of the GE locations, actually in Kentucky, I just remembered. And they've seen some really impressive results. And this is, of course, it's obvious, electrifying a car and then powering it with renewables. That is a big step, of course, of the improvement equation. But now going driverless adds yet more efficiency gains, 40% more cost efficient. The trucks can run on a transport system 24-7. It becomes a logistic system. You can think of it as a highly distributed railroad system. They've seen some really impressive efficiency gains. And of course, this now puts some more extreme requirements on the networks. And it's not the, it's not the downlink that we talk a lot about. It's the uplink. You have tons of high definition video that is being rendered to the machine operator. He or she sits in the control room, can run up to three trucks. And uh, with haptic feedback in the steering wheel can actually feel if a truck runs over little rock. I mean, it's, it's really, really impressive to see some of the things you can do with these type of technologies. I think they have a handful of trucks in the, in the pilot deployment, and they've seen the equivalent of 200 cars in CO2 reductions just on this pilot alone. So, and then last but not least, 
energy production. This is uh, globally one of the single largest contributors to CO2 emission. I think the equation is 80% is still fossil fuel based. And the idea is to reverse that by 2050 to 80% renewables at, at the minimum. The US has more aggressive targets getting to 100% carbon free by 2035. And that is not going to happen unless you fundamentally transform the way energy is being produced. You're going from large single locations to highly distributed production grid with hundreds, thousands of solar panels or wind farms. And that, that, of course, in doing so, you're exposing yourself to a lot of failure in your production environment, which is now highly distributed. Sensors to make sure that you can predict failure before equipment fails. Connecting the sites, smart grid solutions where you actually also now are receiving energy from residential areas that are producing their own solar power or wind power, feeding it back into the energy grid, leveraging AI machine learning to figure out at what time during the day do you charge your Tesla that's parked in the garage because the energy grid can support it in the most cost efficient way between 1 a.m. and 3 a.m. in the morning, for example. So you can see how technology will play a significant role in enabling not only the transformation of industries in a digital way, but also enabling us to produce renewables at scale to support that climate transition across industry sectors. So um, I tried to give you a couple of examples, concrete examples of what we're doing today things that you can think about. We take ownership, I take ownership for, for the things we will do in our own operation. We work very hard with our customers to figure out how we can support them. That's the big yellow blocks on our own uh, charts. And we're very engaged with stakeholders across industries, representatives for the public sector to figure out how we can mobilize at strength together to deliver on these very ambitious targets that we have in front of us. I hope that I was able to pique your interest, uh, maybe plant a seed or two for some things you could be doing within your business or policies that you should be contemplating as a policymaker. It, at the end of the day, it will take all of us coming together as one and imagining possible and driving change. And uh, as I mentioned, I have young kids. We owe it to our kids, the next generation, to set them up for the long term. There is an unlimited amount of possibilities with technology to accelerate the digital transformation of industries. Thank you for your attention. Have a wonderful rest of the day.